Uh, my name is Chad Kaffer. I'm a uh, producer of uh, Flight Test, which is a YouTube channel um, all around radio control flight. So planes, multi-rotors, helicopters, pretty much anything that flies radio control. Um, that's, that's what we cover. So reviews, challenges, um, just all types of things. Uh, I'm Austin, I just, Lauren said I'm working at Rocket Jump, producing the shorts um, that go up on the main channel and other things, and also working to put together the videos for uh, Rocket Jump Film School. Cool, cool. Yeah, so uh, I'm Jamie, I'm the CFO of Rocket Jump, I oversee everything. What does CFO stand for? Yeah, Chief Financial Officer, so I deal all on, you know, the analytical side of it, from the numbers to the budgeting. Um, been there, I've been working these guys since uh, BJHS season two. So, you know, seen everything from the birth of Rocket Jump Film School to our shorts initiative to Rocket Jump, or BJHS season three and uh, all of our new projects coming up. So, yeah, he does a lot. We have Ryan Chappie with us. He's a uh, director of audience strategy at Maker Studios. You want to talk a little bit about that? Um, what sure. Maker Studios is? Yeah, so uh, Maker Studios is a YouTube network, and essentially we work with a lot of uh, different creators from different uh, kind of content categories with kind of the overall goal to really help them fulfill their potential and really increase their viewership and uh, whatever goals they have. And we work with uh, channels like uh, Flight Test, that's how I know Chad and invited him to this. and. Uh, I specifically work in our family content category, so I work with a lot of kids content and also a lot of uh, educational content, uh, kind of like flight test, and yeah. Online videos is a lot different than we're used to with, with filmmaking and that kind of stuff, so the role of producer is a little bit different, or possibly there's a lot of similarities. Can uh, you guys talk a little bit about what goes into your job for producing online video and, and the kind of unique uniqueness that comes with that? Start with uh, Ryan here. Sure. Um, I think, especially on YouTube, like, producer is probably just one of your titles. Um, often you're the producer, the director, the VFX artist, um, particularly when you're really uh, starting out. So I think producer kind of really just uh, I think encapsulates overall what you're doing, which is just like, you know, producing video. Kind of like general manager. It's, it's crazy too because there's just so many different things that can happen throughout a, a shoot. Like I know, so Ashra and I, are, we obviously work pretty closely because we, we deal a lot with the shorts that are going on. Mm -hmm. And just all of the different things that can go wrong and will go wrong, and like having a backup plan, like it, like it, it was insane. Like, you know, you go through the budgeting process and pre-production, you obviously are really, really strict with where you're going to spend your money and where you're going to make the investment in your project. Um, Almost like, you know, it, it's almost like every single day you have to come up with an entirely new budget just because you either get rained out or somebody cancels on you or something breaks or, you know, creative you get a, changes. the creative changes or, you know, like how Freddie loves to do. Freddie's just like, hey, uh, just give me this location and that's it. You don't know what he's shooting. You don't know what he's going to shoot. You don't know who's coming. Um, so you have to be really, really flexible uh, and you have to be uh, willing to, to, to go with the punches and just trust, trust the process a lot of the time. So. so you producers are the people who take what the director and everybody else is doing and actually make it happen. Absolutely. You're the safety net. Yeah. It's a very big picture kind of a yeah. thing. And you're watching out for everybody doing their job and making sure everyone's keeping mm -hmm. on track to create the whole, basically. So um, could each of you tell me like a day-to-day, -day, like um, what are your basic responsibilities as producers of content? I would love to hear what these guys have to say. Yeah. I feel like we're all completely <laughs> different across the board. Yeah, because I'm, I'm listening to you. I'm like, wow, we have like, you know, our budget was five hundred dollars, and yeah. don't spend it all. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so um, yeah, we uh, we would get um, free stuff from sponsors. So you know, we were able to save money there because we could pick up sponsorship. But out of the gate. Um, I, that's what I, and I said 500 because that was literally we, we tried to just do 500 an episode and really stretch that as far as we can and honestly a lot of times we wouldn't even spend it all um, 
But on flight tests, we tried, it's funny because you say script, and we tried to script it so many times, and every time we did it got worse. So we, we actually just went to bullet points and said, let's just make sure we hit the bullet points because every time, in, in our particular format, because we have like a co-hosted thing, I mean, they were good about knowing the, con or the, the knowledge of it. So if, say, they're reviewing a plane, like they would just read the manual and you know, pick up the bullet points. And we would just have to make sure we hit those, but everything else was just kind of all over the place, and that's what made it fun. Yeah. Um, but when you're doing shorts and you know things, it's a little different. That's that's yeah. we never did scripted uh, content. It was always more in the moment, and here's a product, and do something with it. Um, but in in our case, um, producer director. It, I don't know, it wasn't so segmented. And I come from production, I come from doing marketing videos, so we were very regimented in our, and this was like a pushback against the system and saying, well, we're just all gonna be a director and a producer and, and do what we have to to, to make it work. Um, so, I don't know, there's, there's not just one way to do it. Um, I think it depends on what the channel is and you know what they're doing. A lot of them, the talent is the producer and the director and the editor, so. Um, I guess it just depends on, on what you're doing. To, uh, to piggyback off on your points too, when you're talking about the budgets, so I, I think a lot of times when people kind of look at like the entertainment world, like production, they think, okay, the bigger my budget is, that obviously correlates with how good my project's going to be. That could not be farther from the truth, right? Like it, it's still at the end of the day, it's like it comes down to a great creative, and more importantly, it comes down to great execution. So like even when I'm looking, like when I just look at this page right here, like that ping pong masters video, that has 2.7 million views, zero dollar budget, right? We literally filmed that because our neighbors in our office had a ping pong table, and we we're like, hey, like we have a really good idea, like we go down there and shoot something. Same thing with uh, the Mexican standout video. We shot that in an alley. It took us four hours. You know, Key and Peel, who are on network television. They, you know, they spend $150,000 per short, and they film, it takes them a day to film it. We're filming it in an hour, you know, four hours, no budget, and it goes out and it gets 10 million views because views it has a great creative behind it. Um, so it, it, it's, 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 it's just crazy how, um, you know, that can get, uh, that can be a little misleading when it comes yeah. to budget and dollars. So. Yeah, it's very true. I think some of our best episodes were very just, run and gun. Yeah. I mean, the more, yeah. I'm serious, and I hate to say this, but the more we tried to be organized, the worse it got. And right. I mean, it sounds very counterproductive, but right. it, it, our best episodes, like the, there, there was the beginning of that, it showed that rocket episode. Um, David is from Sweden. He was the one that put the rocket on the plane. Uh, he'd come over for months at a time, and he would be like a guest host on our show. And um, it was always like that. Just point the camera at David and see what he does. And, <laughs> you know, and he would always come up with experiments and that. And everybody loved watching it. So I think that's what hooked her. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's what happens a lot with us is that we don't necessarily have a script sometimes. Yeah, and it's just and it's it's stuff my heart on my end. Like I don't know what to get you. Right. I don't know what yeah. you need to make yeah. this video. So you have to just kind of go for it and just ask them and bug them. About yeah. Things. I feel like most of my talking about day to day is just bugging people. That's yeah. my day to day in a nutshell. Is, hey, did you do this? Hey, did you do this? Hey, so how about that? Yeah, that's my day to day. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, and I would argue, like, being part of being a producer is making those weird kind of calls, like, hey, this is not working. We need to scrap it and just get rid of the script. Or, hey, this is not working. I need you to nail down these particular props that you need. And weird phone calls. I had to make a call the other day for a video that's coming out next Monday. Uh, to see where we could get 300 bananas. <laughs> and we killed them ourselves. <laughs> so that's the thing. <laughs> that happens all the time. Yeah. Uh, it's really yeah. funny. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, a lot of people, like, their first question is, like, what exactly is a producer? And, like, why, or is it just numbers? Is it, it sounds boring, I have to organize people, I have to write stuff, I have to do with the, what creative stuff goes into being a producer? <laughs> I think the, the creative would be, you know, classified more under the director or a lot, oftentimes, especially on YouTube, the talent is, is kind of the, the creative. Yeah. Most of the time, they're the ones kind of determining. Like in Flight Test, for instance, Josh and Josh, like they, I just told them what to talk about. They came up with how to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, 
and that w is what I would consider the creative. So my job was to just keep them on track. Just say, hey, you know, we're talking about this, or we're. Um, it, I remember the advice that I gave Josh Beck. So I said, our episodes, all you need is a nugget. So if we, if we did an episode on, um, you know, uh, 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 I'm trying to think of one. Uh, uh, where we cut ribbons, for instance. You have two planes and they have ribbons and you have to cut them. Um, we would talk about a technique, you know, because when you're, when you're doing that, there's a nugget of information you need to have in order to have fun to do, to do that. And it might be, um, you know, the rules of the game. So they would, they would focus on that nugget of information. And then the rest is just kind of inspiration. It's, it's showing people how to have fun and having fun legitimately on camera. And that's what worked for us. So, so my thing was just making sure they didn't get too rigid. Like they would actually start to s explain every little detail, like I probably am right now, and it makes it less fun. Um, so my job was to just make sure they they got that nugget of information and then just have fun with the rest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So making it happen so the creatives can have space to work. And right. Yeah. Because th that's what they'll do. They'll 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 rabbit trail all over the place. So you just need to make sure they hit your your centerpiece, and then once that's handled, then the rest can be cut out in the editing. <laughs> I think it's very much a collaboration, too. You have to just constantly talk through things and problem solving. And that's all, all comes a lot with the territory. Yeah. Because I feel like they're you know, bouncing all over the place, so you have to just kind of keep them in, in one yeah. solid place and move them in the right direction. And uh, you know we're lucky enough to work with pretty pretty smart, creative people, and they are also very savvy when it comes to getting things done. So our job, I feel, is, is pretty, not easy, but it, 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 it's, it helps just having people that are fun to work with, right. that know what they want, even if they don't have a script written down. Right. Uh, it, it helps a lot, because you end up with a great product. And what we do, making basically a short film every couple weeks, yeah. there's a lot that's involved with that, because it's, you know, it's, it's a very, you're making a film all the time. And it's yeah, it's very interesting. It's it's almost like the like the direct the director whoever the creative is on the project has that vision, and the producer's job is to help execute that vision, right? Um, and so it's it's definitely a yin and a yang, and they both feed off each other, right? So yeah. And when you're talking about being involved in the creative as a producer, often um, you know that means kind of setting some of the limits. I mean, you're often in charge of the budget, so you know yeah. you can't necessarily have the biggest explosion ever, so you gotta you know, work with your team and say like, okay, maybe we can have a smaller explosion. <laughs> and um, yeah, I often find that it's really often setting those boundaries, which for a lot of creative people can be a really good thing because creative people are like, like Chad said, can be kind of all over the place. And it's really important to like, you know, keep them focused on whatever kind of goal or shot you're working towards. Um, and before we open it up for questions, one last thing. Um, what would be your advice for people working with little to no budget? Like what is a good trick up your sleeve or what is a good um, just kind of creative solutions that you've found working with your particular videos? Because I know a lot of the, the filmmakers here and in and, and Jump and, and fans and stuff, they're like, I have no money. Right. How do I make a good video? Right. Yeah, I don't think the money matters personally. Um, I think our videos, honestly, are overproduced. And it's because I come from production, so I, I always wanted to look nice, but they didn't have to. Um, I think it's, it's two things. It's listening to your audience and then inspiring them. So listening to what they're saying and then you know, giving them what, what they're asking for in an inspirational way. And that's, that's always our, that's how we stay on track. And it always works as long as, it, it, the more fun we have on camera and the more inspiring it looks or feels, the, yeah. the more views you get. I mean, they can, the audience can tell if you're into it or not. Yeah. I think being efficient helps a lot. You know, really look at, you know, if you have a script, really look at it and see what's needed to tell the story you want to tell. And have that in mind. Don't get stuck on, well, I really need this shot, this explosion, this crane, this helicopter. Yeah. Just see what, what's needed to make your film. It's better to have it done than not do it at all because you couldn't afford a specific thing. So I think being efficient with filmmaking really helps when it comes to that. So you have the first idea. And I think a big problem is a lot of people that I know too, you know, when they write, they don't let themselves think big and then go small. 
they just like just ignore the idea they have. They're like, no, I can I can never do it. But write whatever you have first, and then go through it. And you know, your your tenth draft is really what's going to be what you shoot, not the first idea. So I think that's kind of a big a big thing to help do smaller productions is go through it and make it as efficient as possible. Yeah. No, I I, I completely agree. I think. Uh, the one piece of advice I would give is just go do it, okay? Everyone has a cell phone. Like, we have better cameras in our pockets than I ever even, that we ever had access to growing up. Like, I know, if we lived in a world where, you know, you still had to use your mom and dad's, you know, uh, the, the big camcorder that had, you know, the VHS tape in it, you know, like, we still live in that world. Like, yeah, there's a million different uh, excuses why you can't go do it. But uh, now with how easy it is, you know, to have access to a great camera and how, you know, there's there's a million different uh, types of platforms out there to release it, yeah. you know, whether it's through, you know, social networking or, you know, just uploading straight to YouTube. Uh, there's no reason not to go out and do it. There's a know? feature that was at Sundance that I think sold for five or six million dollars that was shot on the iPhone. Most yeah. of it is. Yeah. Because they had to get away with shots in subways and other places. Yeah. So there's really no excuse. Right. And it, it's crazy too because there's even like we've even heard of like big brands out there. I mean, we're talking like you know Pepsi or Coca Cola. Those guys are saying like, hey, why aren't you making a movie, you know, on Snapchat? Or why aren't you making a movie on Instagram? So there's there is like not only is there the ability to go make it, but there's also a demand out there for it too. So it's it's anyone's game to go out there and go create something that these people you know want to put money into. Yeah. Yeah, and I would add that um, it's really important to be aware of the different free resources available yeah. to you. Um, specifically coming from a background where I've worked with a lot of uh, educational content, there's a lot of incredible stuff in the public domain that you can work with. Um, pretty much anything that like NASA does is kind of public domain, so if you're looking for like a shot of a cool rocket, you know, you learn to really you know, do a great Google search, confine it to the NASA.gov site, you'll find some amazing shots that you can incorporate into um, your footage. Same goes for music. Um, music's like a very tricky thing to find, uh, kind of free stuff to go with your, uh, with your videos, but there are resources out there that um, you, know, you can incorporate royalty-free music. And there's also a whole lot of um, uh, learning tools out there. Um, you know, personally, I've done a lot of work in kind of After Effects, and I taught myself completely from uh, you know sites like Video Copilot, and um, I know Rocket Jump can definitely. Rocket Jump School. Shit, self promotion. <laughs> and of course, the library is a terrific resource. Um, you know, if you're trying to teach yourself something, I know some of the first stuff that I learned, uh, kind of about the digital media world. I got free eBooks from the LA Public Library. So, shout out to the library. <laughs> well, let's open it up to you guys, because uh, I know you all have, probably have pressing questions for for our guys here. Um, yeah, I just have a question for you. Kind of, you have this film school, so it's an online thing run through the library. Could you just explain it a little more? Yeah, uh, Rocket Jump Film School is something we're developing right now. We're going to have an online uh, website. We're going to upload tutorials covering every aspect of filmmaking. Um, it's going to remain free. We're going to have forums um, where you can come and chat to other people watching the videos. You can chat with the people in the videos. We're going to have live times where we're talking with you and talking about the shorts that Rocket Jump just did and you can talk with the filmmakers and have interaction and, and it's going to be very um, user based so depending on your feedback the film school will change to kind of fit the needs of what people need. Um, so it's all going to be online, the tutorial videos can be anywhere from like 30 seconds of how to properly change a lens to 20 minutes of actually going through and doing a VFX shot in After Effects or that kind of stuff. Um, and we want to make sure it's free and that everyone can do it. So we are going to be releasing footage for people to edit. We're going to be releasing sound effects for people to edit sound and design sound um, and make it uh, open enough so anybody who has just even free software, it doesn't have to be the, the special like fancy stuff, can learn how to make a good movie with what they have. So when is it going to be available? Uh, we're going to start uploading videos in the next couple months, and then the 
website we're hoping we're hoping to have like an official website in April, like a functioning website in April. We're saying soon. Yeah, we're saying soon. 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 <laughs> soon. 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 But we, if you do check out, we have um, forums on the Rocket Jump site. We do have a Rocket Jump Film School section where we're already answering questions. We've released a couple test videos. Um, you can get a feel of what the the people who are watching the videos like who they are and what they want to see and what we're about as well. So there's already a community happening if you want to check it out. Um, I can actually answer the part about the library. Um, sorry, I'm just in the back taking pictures. Um, so part of this is funded by the Institute for Museum and Library Studies. Um, we got a grant to do some innovative programming. And the, of course, the first thing I thought of, because I went to school with a lot of these guys, is all the cool stuff that you can do online. Um, and there was a real dearth of hands-on activities that you could do in person with other people, um, and like also fostering like an online environment. So I knew that Rocket Jump Film School was happening. Lauren and I have been friends since 2004. 2004. So we decided to partner up and bring this and sort of test and pilot a lot of this stuff out in the library setting, see what people respond to, see what works well, and then um, go from there. So I was really happy that she said yes to my crazy idea of bringing something that's supposed to be all online to an in-person format. So anyway. Any other questions? It can be a question about anything. Yeah. Yeah, um, I know with flight tests you had mentioned your original idea was if, uh, like after three weeks, I think you said, if it wasn't working, then you kind of like give up or whatever, you move to something else. Right. Like, what is a good barometer to kind of look at what you're doing if you're not getting the hits? Because obviously, well, an audience is really hard to find no matter what. Right. So, like, what what do you say is a good thing to kind of really go there and say, okay, I'm not getting the hits. I need to change something or do something else. Or well, I think everybody's barometer or temperature gauge is going to be different. Mine was um, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know if I specifically had an exact metric, but I just knew you know if it would be worth it or not. You know, I, I had been in business for a long time, so I, I figured I can only dedicate so many time, so much time and resources to this. So. If, if we were able to get sponsorship of any kind, I think that would have been enough traction, but we ended up getting a lot of sponsorship really, really fast. Um, I'm sure the quality of response too helps, you know, so oh, yeah. how positive the response uh, is, mm -hmm. even if it's small in numbers, but it's super positive, mm -hmm. it gives you the motivation and the, yeah, I mean, the thought that it is. So you think it was a positive response that eventually you could possibly get bigger, or, like, it basically comes down to, well, I guess the other question is, should you advertise? Like, how do you get an audience if you're not getting the audience? Well, yeah, and careful on the advertising. A lot of people like to rush into that because they hear, oh, I can monetize this. And they, mm -hmm. we, um, I, I was pretty clear up front, like, I didn't want to take from my audience. I didn't want to make them sit through, uh, um, you know, a 30-second commercial if they didn't even know they liked me yet. You know, so I, I, was, I was careful on giving first. You know, make sure that I gave them the highest quality content first, and then, you know, see what they wanted. And then when when we started getting people that were hooked and they're like looking forward to the next episode, now you feel obligated. You're like, oh, I have to make it, you know, a video. So um, I don't know. You you can know, but I think the important thing is that you you determine what that is. Like that you determine some kind of metric or what do you want out of it? Do you want views? Do you want you know exposure? Do you want affirmation? You know, what what do you want out of it? And then you know, just, just to see if you're on track. Because otherwise, um, I, I've had a fair amount of friends that chase the views, and I would recommend against it because it's, it, you start pandering at that point. You just start creating something to try to get <coughs> views. Um, I would say anybody that's gonna make anything, make something of value, make, make people laugh, you know, teach them something, share something, inspire them. You know, do something that's mutual, you know, where you can, you can have a, a a give and take, and you know, it's both sides. And I would say any channel to to start by giving first. Don't don't even think about what you can get out of it until you know that you can responsibly give. Um, that's my philosophy. Yeah, I, I would add the to kind of the do something of value point is do something of value to yourself. Um, 
Because if somebody comes to me saying, oh, I, I want to start a channel, like, you know, what, what should I do? How should I go about it? I always tell them that, like, you know, especially, I think you had mentioned views earlier, if, if you're looking for viewership, if you're looking for an audience, um, particularly on a platform like YouTube, it takes a lot of time, and a lot of time equals a lot of videos. So even before you really, you know, potentially see what you're doing getting traction, it's going to be a lot of time and effort on your part. So I always recommend that people do something where, you know, they're constantly learning. Um, try to incorporate like some sort of skill. Perhaps you wanted to learn like After Effects better. Um, you know, make that one of the main goals. Just because you know there's such a long, often such a long lead time between like creating something and seeing some sort of like measurable success viewership wise. Yeah, and the, the thing that we've been, we've learned at Rocket Jump, and as I'm learning kind of creating the series, is that if you are making something that you don't really care about, you're not going to want to wait through Might that well time up. period. <laughs> okay. um, but what we also realized is that um, consistency is also key. So if you are releasing content um, consist consistently in a timely manner and you are excited about it and you can kind of feel like, these kids are really dedicated, like, yeah, I'll give them five minutes of my time Mondays, you know, every week. Um, that's kind of what draws people in. And then it's the interaction that separates a lot of online content from like movies or TV or that kind of stuff. And, and online social media is changing that a little bit. You can interact with your favorite directors and actors and stuff on Twitter. But what's been building audiences with Rocket Jump and with um, big YouTube um, channels is that we are in constant conversation with people. We're, we're, we're excited to talk to them. We're excited to hear from them. Um, you can't just put something out and expect it to speak for you um, and just leave it, you know, untouched. You know, put, your, put your mark on it. Put your voice on it. Um, talk with the people who are watching it. Um, interact and ask them to interact and, and kind of get um, it, it's funny because you're you're appearing in these people's homes, like in their computers and on their phones, and they kind of feel like they know you, and that's kind of what um, gets people kind of hooked in. They have a different type of loyalty. Yeah, I, I watched the chat on YouTube for like two years before finally meeting him in person. That I met him in person. I was like, wow, it feels like I've actually known you for like two yeah. years. Yeah. I live in Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> what question over here? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a where do, you, where do you guys start with your budget when you get like a short started? Like where do you start? With your budget? You, so there's two ways to go. You can either set a limit and go down, but really the first way you do is if look goes up. goes up. <laughs> you, do is you look yeah. at the script itself, right? You yeah. look at what the script calls for. So say you have something like what we have, uh, the, the script, the, um, the every 90s commercial. Right away you see a, a mutant that needs to be made. That's expensive. So right away, I mean, that alone you can make five videos for. You know, so it just depends what you want to do. You could, and what the creative is, and that kind of will detract, uh, subtract, or add to your budget. And you can just keep going that way. And then you can do things really small too. So something you can spend a lot of money on, you can make the choice to not. You yeah. know, and, and it also depends on what you want to put on camera to what you want to do otherwise. Do you want to? pay to you, because a lot of what goes into a budget is labor, and it's um, everything that's kind of supporting what goes on to camera. So, you know, we had a shoot downtown. We could have bought the whole parking lot, got a trailer, got bathrooms, got monitors, the whole thing, but we didn't. We took 10 spots, we used the bathroom in a hotel, and, and we didn't shut down the street. That saves you a lot. So yeah. it just kind of depends how you want a production to run. Yeah. And that's where you go when you're kind of deciding on the budget. I, I think, yeah, kind of like what Ash was saying, like it comes down to, it, it, it's, it's, just, it's just all over the place until you know what the creative is, yeah. right? Until, until you know what you're trying, what the beast is. And I think when, when we sat down and talked about it, Ash and I both have, we come from the same mindset that like, if we're going to have a budget, that budget's going on screen, right? That's going to go out there because we want our audience to enjoy it. it, it, it it's not about having you know, lobster for lunch and, you know, steaks for dinner or anything like that. Uh, it, it's, it's about putting the best possible product on screen. Um, so, so when you look at it like that, it's really, really easy when you look at your budget, you say, okay, if I have to make a decision between, you know, spending more on color correction, 
or you know spending more on office supplies, I'm going to go on the color correction time you know, every single chance I get. So. That being said, you'll never have a happier crew if you feed them well. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. I was going to say our highest budget <laughs> item was food. Yeah, it's, yeah. You like seriously always feed your crew well. Absolutely. If you have people coming out to help out. Feed them. Yeah. It yeah. makes a difference. Yeah. Don't do pizza every yeah. single time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 pretty good. One meal is fine. Sometimes burritos are great. Also, I oh go ahead. For, for doing things on the cheap, one thing I did in college is you go to a bakery and ask them to pick up their leftover croissants and baked goods, and then you can feed your crew the next morning for that. And they stay completely fresh. They just can't use it. So that's a note for everybody. Yeah. Well, we happen to, in my hometown is Nichols Bakery, so yeah, we have. There you go. We have. We have. It tells me a lot about you, Asher. Yeah. It tells me a lot about college. Come on. That was but I wanted to say something about budget real quick because I was really thinking about this the other day. If you have a vision in your head of something you want to create, like that, you know, like that short film or something, it's going to be expensive. If you have like you said earlier, like a location or something, and then you're creative with found situations yeah. and materials, it's way cheaper. Yeah. So it's always more expensive if you're trying to, to, you know, you have a story or you have an idea in your head and you're trying to make exactly that, it's always gonna cost more money than if you, you know, and that's why we were able to do a lot on the cheap because we get a, say we get a multi-rotor sent to us, and then we just had to be creative. Like we didn't have to do, you know, a script or you know something that was very specific. We just had to find what's the best way to show off what it's capable of. And we'd have a location, we'd have a product, we'd have talent, and we would just go. Um, so it's just kind of the two different ways to work with a budget. In that case, we just have to support them. We have to feed them. We have to, you know, buy band aids. Yeah. You know. <laughs> it's funny. We just we just did a video on our second channel on Rock Jump too. Uh, where kind of when you're talking about like embracing the resources that you have uh, in our in our office we had a big uh, warehouse space that's just literally full of boxes like it, it's just full of boxes so like I look at that because I'm not a creative guy I look at that as an annoyance right like I have to walk past these boxes every day well uh, one of our guys on our team John uh, he looked at it and he's like if you rearrange these boxes this can be a maze and he started, he started to think of a story to it, and like literally within three hours, he had an entire story, he had an entire script. There were two people in the office, he's like, you guys work perfect, and that was a video that I think we put up two weeks ago. Why were there so many boxes? We were, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's for an answer. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Don't even remind me. Oh, we oh, need to go to the There's, there's even more. The banana. The banana. Oh, yeah. All of my bananas. All of my bananas. The, the guy who peeled them on set, I think he did it in an hour and 15 minutes. 300 bananas. Four, four bananas a minute, I think? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we so we were like doing the calculations on set. <laughs> we're like, Michael's doing about four bananas, but I think he can do better. Yeah. <laughs> we all had over-unders on how fast he could do it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And then they yeah, threw all the banana peels at me because I had the camera. And that oh, was that's, oh, that's, yeah. <laughs> but that's coming that's out funny. later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you get to the point where you feel like you're cranking out consistent videos and you feel like you've got pretty good creative content, do you think it's a worthwhile investment to do any advertising with YouTube or like PR outreach or like what are your thoughts on that? If you're cranking out consistent content, first of all, like that's a win in itself because that's really, really hard to yeah. do. Um, so kudos, kudos that's where you're at. Um, I would... <sighs> I, okay, so like the old saying is like uh, content is king, right? Content is king, distribution is queen. So knowing that content is king, like people will find great content no matter where it is, whether it's Snapchat, YouTube, Netflix, CBS, Fox, uh, Hulu, you know, like I, I just watched a documentary on Google Play, uh, you know, it cost me $2 and I was like, I want to see this, I want to see it right now, and it's great content, so I'm going to find it anyway. So I, I would think like, it always has to start with, is this great content, and what can I do to make it better? Like that, that, that should always be the place that it starts from. Yeah, I would say that um, you know, if you're looking to invest in advertising, mm -hmm. invest in time instead, kind of yeah. like the PR angle you were talking about. Um, you know, good content will find an audience, but perhaps not as fast as you want it to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in that case, often it's you know, trying to find the right communities online to reach out yeah. to. 
Um, I think like flight test is like a perfect example of content that already had an existing community and in many cases it was just a matter of making them aware of it whether you're like posting on some uh, multi-rotor message boards or like you know reaching out to you know even some bigger blogs like Gizmodo or something say hey we've got this awesome rocket plane like you know you may not be necessarily interested in a whole lot of RC planes but this thing's really cool and we think a you know large slice of your viewership or readership would be interested in it. Yeah, and I'm very opinionated about this because I come from marketing and I hate it. Um, <laughs> and I, I kind of swore like I'm not going to spend any advertising or marketing dollars and we didn't, you know, and we have uh, 260,000 subscribers now but they're very hardcore dedicated subscribers and I would take that over you know, if we say we, we, we pumped up the numbers by advertising and, and convincing people to subscribe, it, it would, you, you have uh, soft subscribers, you know, they don't really interact. And, you know, so uh, be careful with the numbers there and why you would want to market or advertise. I think, if, like Ryan said, just get into the right communities. And if yeah. you get any PR, do press releases. It's all, it's pretty much free and it'll end up getting to the, peop the right people. Yeah. So didn't you say that you started by just going to the forums yeah. and looking at what people want on the and, forums? Right? And what's really cool, you can go yeah. back to RC groups in 2010, it's all there, and you can see my very first thread. Hey, I'm thinking about doing a show, you know, and you can watch, and then you'll see our first show get released. And then, you yeah. know, and that's the great thing about forums, it's just like a whole history of what happened. Right. Yeah, and expanding on what Ryan was saying, I remember um, I shot a music video for Jimmy Wong, Freddie Wong's brother, and it had a very uh, unique look to it where we actually changed the shape of the bokeh in the background. It's a photography trick and, and you can do it in post with, you know, uh, After Effects or whatever, but we did it in camera. And that was our thing. We're like, we can really talk about this. So we actually emailed a bunch of photography blogs and we're like, hey, we did this cool, interesting thing where we actually turned the background lights into text and we turned them into hearts and we turned them into all this stuff uh, in camera. And we had a cool, I wrote up a blog, I wrote up the, what I found interesting about it and that's what people picked up on it. Was it like, oh cool, like look at this well-produced short. It's like, look at this really interesting thing they did to make this music video and kind of um, searched out just those people. So it wasn't the usual, like, let's put it on Reddit, let's put it on whatever. It's like, let's send this to, like, in, like those photography sites. And then um, I think we sent it to this guy who created the original, like, Boca kit for cameras, and we didn't realize it was him. And he was like, oh, this is really cool. And, he, and that was, like, our biggest um, site for views was from him. Um, so, yeah. And I think even with every 90, 90s commercial ever, it kind of had that title in itself as the marketing to kind of get people to click on it because it, that is, it's a very different video than just a spoof of a commercial because it goes in a very different way but that's the reason people love it is that it puts you in this mode of like 90s commercials and then completely rips you out of it and throws you into a different thing entirely but it, so it kind of, it's knowing your content and how to sell it. So yeah, yeah. you have a photography trick to have uh, a theme that people like and everyone likes talking about the 90s and other things that oh my god I'm so yeah. old. This so you put that out there and you know. This is a like great it. video for Reddit. It's not a great video for the photography blog. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You're not gonna email the exact same people like yeah. look at this. It's so cool. Yeah, sitting, yeah. you know, we'll talk about practical effects and that kind yeah. of stuff. And but a lot of it horror is like, like horror blog. Uh, horror and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah, and when, when you're talking about kind of advertising, um, YouTube, if you're looking at YouTube, it kind of does something similar. Like these videos, like over here, in many cases, um, I don't necessarily think it's the top four videos, but some of the videos on the sidebar are a little lower down. It's all kind of determined by YouTube's algorithms, so having kind of a general knowledge of like kind of SEO and how that works um, can really, you know, perhaps get you next to somebody else's video. And in that case, you know, like you said, kind of the thumbnail and the title is a really important kind of piece of advertising that can, um, you know, bring you some, a new audience. You, you made me think of something else too. Um, cross promotions and, and that. And one of the things we, we did was uh, another hobby of mine is Lomography and in, instant photography. So we took a tricopter and we put a Lomo instant camera on it and took it up and took the first 
radio control aerial Lomo <laughs> photo. That's awesome. And you know, that got traction because it, it blended two worlds. You know, so you have the Lomo uh, community that was interested in half, uh, probably half of them thought it was stupid, but <laughs> at least they were talking about it. Did, and, you, did uh, you put it on Instagram with hashtag no filter? No. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. But uh, it's still one of my favorite episodes. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, the cross promotions are good. And you guys are out here. We're in Ohio. We don't have any channels around us. Like, you know, out here there's channels all over the place. So um, you, you probably find a, a good cross promotion. Yeah. Um, what do you guys find is the best way for doing collaborations with other YouTubers or artists, uh, both reaching out to them and finding who you want to collaborate with and figuring out what you want to collaborate and what you want to make? Um, well, for us, it's, it's, first you gotta kind of have your own presence online, having an established style, even if it's a couple of videos on your own channel, or a blog, or something, if, if you don't have anything to show people, people are gonna be like, I don't know who you are, or what you're doing, like, why is this kid talking to me? Um, but really investing in the type of videos that you want to make, and putting out stuff that you like, and, and getting stuff out there, and, and, um, interacting on Twitter, interacting in the comments, interacting on that kind of stuff um, is a really good first step just to kind of get yourself out there and, and it, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be right and jump, it doesn't have to be a, amazing, it just has to have your voice in it. Um, so when you're approaching other people, you want to Kind of come at it as um, you're an equal collaborator. You're not looking to use them for views. You're not looking to help boost your own channel. It's like I think you would be good for my content because, and I think I would be good for your content because. Um, so it is a relationship. It is a mutually beneficial thing, um, and you kind of have to come at it with um, respect and 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 looking at it for the art you want. And what she's humbly saying is, you know, when, when you have a lot of subscribers, you get people every day saying, hey, can you subscribe to me? Can you do this? Can you do that? And what they don't realize is how many people are doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, um, it's, but I understand it, but, but it, it still comes back to content. Like, make the good content. It'll, it'll find a way. If you're not getting subscribers, then you have to accept that you don't have the content. You know, you're not producing what people want to watch. And a lot of people won't give it up. You know, they've been doing it for three years and they have 20 views, you know. And, um, you know, and then some people, like my son actually started his own gaming channel and he doesn't even care. Like, he, he gets about 100 views a video. He does Let's Plays. And I'm like, who's subscribing? He's like, I don't know. Like, he doesn't even care. He just keeps putting them up, but he, he doesn't care. So, you know, if, if that's what you want to do, then, you know, go for it. And, um, you know, he's happy with the, the five people that comment, you know, and he, he responds to every one of them. Yeah, I say be open to, like, really creative collaborations because, you know, you never know who out there might be a fan of the type of stuff that you're doing. And when you're kind of looking for those potential like creative collaborations, I always say uh, keep audience in mind. Um, you don't necessarily have to like you know have topics that really cross over, but if you have audience that crosses over, you know demographic wise or just interest wise, um, you know that could be a potential match for you if you're looking to you know gain some exposure from it. I'd say don't be afraid of just being different too. Yeah, don't pigeonhole yourself and do one thing. Just collaborate with as many people as possible and try different things. And, you, know, you might want to just do feature films, but then, oh, YouTube is here, and then there's so many different you know, ways you can go. So I'd say don't be too close-minded and stubborn. I think it's got to be open to anything happening. Yeah. yeah. Also, don't just be, don't be afraid of just, like, just reaching out to people. And just yeah. hear, you'll be amazed how many people respond. Like, I know we, <laughs> this is really stupid, a couple of years ago, like, we, were, we were trying to get in touch with Mark Cuban, and we literally just like Googled it and found his email address and it was markcuban at gmail.com. <laughs> and we emailed him and I was like, hey, like I went to Indiana University and like asked him a question and he emailed back. Really? And like that's awesome. literally that's all we did was Google and send him an email and it was just really nice. Yeah, <laughs> markcuban at gmail. <laughs> LinkedIn. It's out there. It's yeah. out there. I, I did that before I moved down. It was I added every because I was really in animation for a while and I wanted to work at Disney. 
and I just added every single person on LinkedIn to the point where they blocked me on the site. They're like, you cannot add people you don't know. <laughs> but I want to meet people. And I actually have friends to this day that I met like just by randomly messaging them. Recruiters will always accept random invitations. Other people, not so much. Uh, but and yeah, I've like messaged random people and I've met them. It's cool. There's, yeah. you know, there, there are the resources out there to, mm -hmm. to interact with people. Um, so if not individuals, companies that you're interested in working for, learning, learning more from, or doing similar things, there are people that are within that company you could totally get in touch with. Um, I think the moral of the story is, you know, to do it with a purpose, yeah. not, not, and not just a selfish purpose is yeah. you know, what it is. I, I, I try to network, and any time I, I reach out, I try, to, I try to give first, you know, and I think that, that principle, it works. And, and especially if you're young or a student or, or like don't under, underestimate using your status as a student or as a person or is learning film to reach out because I like one of the things that USC taught me was just like really milk being a student while you can because people want to help students they want to connect with students um, I d took a chance and, and wrote an email to the you know really bland contact form of um, a composer I really admired who's done all these big movies and he like wrote me back personally and had me call his studio and like gave me a really cool interview for a report I was doing on my class. And it was, um, oh, uh, yeah, right, I yeah. just felt yeah. myself yeah. blinking yeah. as I was talking about him. He did the Little Miss Sunshine. Uh, oh, so, oh, nice. Like, oh, uh, it starts with an M and it's blinking, but he was the sweetest man and I was just like, oh, I'm a little Yossi student. I'm going to talk to you about this other. And he would just like, yeah. just talk to me. And so, you know, be open with, I want to learn how to do this. I'm really invested in doing this project. Like, just be honest, be forthcoming, and and really care about what you're doing. Yeah. Because um, people can tell. Yeah. yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Do you guys see any platforms in the next couple of years coming to like YouTube's level? And also, really quick. What about selling on video on demand services like iTunes and Amazon, things like that? What kind of videos? Yeah. Features. Well, features, yeah, definitely have a, a big future on, on demand. Uh, short form in that, I, I personally don't see it being monetized that way. I don't, because I, I don't want to, I don't want to pay for five minutes. You know what I mean? Like it's more trouble to have to log into my PayPal than you know to, to watch five minutes. So. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people feel that way, but yeah, I think the pay-per-view is probably going to be more for the long-form narrative style and documentaries. So. Yeah, Hulu and Amazon and Netflix are really coming up, and, and those are bigger than YouTube um, in terms of just you know companies behind them and like they're bigger institutions. Yeah, yeah. and not um, just playing other people's stuff, but creating yeah. their own content. Yeah. yeah, but that's showing a larger shift in the industry. It's like usually you were at the mercy of you know being in theaters and being in, and going through specific networks and distribution channels. But you're seeing these big guys like Netflix and that's you know start to produce their own content and get more creative. Um, and one one app that really surprised me was Vine, and that that skyrocketed into these really yeah. interesting short stories and, and people were doing long form stuff on Vine. Yeah. There was a couple accounts that had this long running series that was actually really compelling and they took a form that's really limited and they did something creative with it and that's kind of what YouTube was at the beginning. Yeah. Um, and then Snapchat is trying to do something similar. Yeah. Snapchat's making a push and then I know Facebook. Facebook's really trying to get mm -hmm. into the video side of things. Like they're, we'll uh, yeah. they're making... There's, you know, there's probably platforms we, yeah, we yeah. that will, they'll be formed in a garage two months yeah. from now, and yeah, they'll take know. over, yeah. you know. But uh, I, I think, I think the key there is not necessarily what platforms do we know today, because literally it could be completely different six months from now, three months from now, right? Um, but the thing is, like even when when the guys, when like Freddie and the guys first started on YouTube, they took the platform serious, right? They were like, we're gonna create really good content. We're gonna put a lot of pride in our stuff and we're gonna create the content that we wanna watch ourselves, right? We wouldn't expect someone else to watch us if we hated ourselves. So when you take it serious and you go that route and you actually make it your, your focus, you don't just treat it as like some, you know, it, it, some side thing, some ancillary, uh, you know, dist distribution platform, 
that's when you have a chance to really capture the audience. And that's when you have a chance to go out there uh, and build something great. So whatever it is, just take it serious. Put a really good product out there. Uh, yeah, at the time, no one expected YouTube to become what it was. It was cat videos and people dancing and following YouTube down. YouTube was a joke. Yeah. yeah. It was, it was non-existent. <laughs> it, it was a new thing to upload your own stuff. Yeah. Well, and it's still, right now, it's a, it's a good time to get in because it's it's still kind of, we were talking earlier about it, it's, it's not quite, I don't want to call it mainstream, but it's... Uh, traditional Hollywood's still kind of unaware of what's going on with YouTube. Yeah. So you grab it now, you know, um, make a mark in it now. And you know, cause I, I have no idea what a year from now is going to look like. Yeah. It's going to be different. And not even just YouTube. Right. Any, yeah. any of the yeah. different platforms. Vimeo is a great platform for certain, for certain types of programs. Yeah. Um, documentaries are finding a huge home on Vimeo. Yeah. yeah, I think that gets to an important point is, you know, Definitely do your research if you're looking to, uh, you know, try on another platform, figure out what sort of audience is there. Like, if it's buying, it's probably going to be, like, perhaps a younger audience than you might find on, say, Facebook. And that can help inform, like, some of your decision making as far as, like, what am I going to actually make? What about Maker TV? <laughs> That's it. <laughs>